so long as people continue to identify those, those themselves through the kind of left-right dichotomy, it'll be it's, it's going to be very easy for those in power to simply ensure that you know any you know quote unquote populist that, that pops up uh, can be stopped from getting into power by simply painting him as either extreme right or extreme left. For the wrong to rule, the good must just stand idly by. Hello. My guest today is an activist, writer and filmmaker. He's very much a man of the left, but his public stances from the benefits of Brexit, the value of the nation states and the crimes of lockdown mark him out from those who would claim that that mantle today. His books include The Battle for Europe, How an Elite Hijacked a Continent, and We Can Take It Back. Reclaiming the State, fantastic title. We love anything with the word reclaim in it at all. A progressive vision of sovereignty for a post-neoliberal world. And most recently, the COVID consensus, the global assault on democracy and the poor, a critique from the left, co-authored with Toby Green. So joining me all the way from Italy, it's my pleasure to speak to Thomas Fatsy. Thomas, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Loris. Uh, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. and Thanks for having me. So um, these these are not the book titles of someone from that we would associate with the modern left. What's the difference between the woke left and the and the traditional left? Right. Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> um, uh, I like uh, like you know my co-author Toby as well and 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 others. I mean, we have uh, there are a lot of people on the left that have uh, been feeling estranged with the uh, contemporary left for, for quite some time because uh, we feel that it has abandoned much of uh, what the left used to uh, used to stand for. And so, for example, uh, coming from the left, I've always, for me, it's always uh, you know been natural to be uh, opposed to the European Union and the Euro, which I've always seen as a you know, profoundly anti-democratic project uh, uh, aimed at you know, taking power away from sovereign democratic nation states and transferring it to supranational institu- institutions which aren't democratically accountable, which aren't really democratic at all. Um, you know, this is something that used to be pretty straightforward in, in, in the left. That's why, I mean, a lot of communist and socialist parties used to be uh, anti-European Union uh, and back and forth against the European Union. Uh, or, you know, uh, up until the 80s and even the 90s in some cases. Now it's kind of, you know, switched. And we saw that, for example, in the in the whole Brexit debate in the in the in the UK, obviously, where we know that most of the most of those on the left were pro EU and pro Remain. And most of those that wanted to leave were, were on the right. So I think that, you know, that points to the fact that something profound has happened. But, you know, the issue of sovereignty is uh is one that I've focused a lot in in the past because you know it really encapsulates from my point of view uh, the, this radical shift in the that has happened in the left over the past uh, over, over the past decades. But I mean, uh, the, the the pandemic, of course, brought to the fore a whole number of other contradictions, and in some respects, uh, simply confirmed uh, you know my, my idea that uh, you know an actual anthropological mutation, you know, a genetic <laughs> genetic mutation had really, um, you know, the, had really happened to the left over the past uh, decades. And I think what we saw over the past three years uh, confirms that and goes way, you know, beyond what, you know, what, 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 my, what were my worst uh, worries and concerns up until, um, you know, up until the pandemic. Um, so, so you're saying that um, essentially that, that COVID and, you know, we'll come on to your book, um, but COVID was really the uh, was the boil coming out essentially from um, from everything that had been going on, you know, that w- we were mainly blind to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially uh, I think COVID brought to the brought to the surface uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know trends and undercurrents that were already happening that were bubbling under the surface. And so, of course, when it, when, we, when we look at the left, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned what you know what's what's different between the you know the woke left and the and the old left, well, the old left used to be uh, one that was rooted in, uh, in, in, in working classes. Uh, it used to be Free concerned speech, with working class concerns. Uh, you know, that's why it used to be known as the labor left. Now it is only the name left, but, you know, it hasn't really got much to do with labor anymore uh, in the UK or, or elsewhere. And it used to be concerned with issues such as uh, inequality and democracy and sovereignty. And, uh, you know, it used to be against the... Uh, it used to stand against the capture of the state by private interests, by corporate interests. It used to be, uh, uh, it used to stand against, uh, uh, you know, it used to deconstruct the uh, the dominant narratives uh, that elites, uh, you know, regularly pull out to justify their their, poli- their policies. I mean, even if we, if we go 
back, you know, 20 years to the, to the Iraq war. Uh, of course, you know, I mean, people, those in power will always try to justify their policies with grand humanitarian and, uh, you know, progressive uh, narratives. You know, we all remember that war being justified as a war for democracy and freedom. But you know, at the time, at least there was, you know, a good part of those that left was, a bit, you know, could read through the bullshit and realize that, you know, clearly or most likely the war was about, you know, something other than just bringing democracy and freedom to uh, to the Middle East. And that used to be pretty straightforward. So this is not the first time that those in power, you know, come up with uh, <clears throat> uh, progressive humanitarian narratives to justify their policies. But this is the first time that you know, pretty much everyone on the left fell for that narrative and pretty much took it, you know, at face to, at face value and ended up uh, basically defending or embracing uh, policies that have, uh, that again, have gone against everything that the left uh, you know, used to stand for and should stand for. You know, these are policies that have overwhelmingly um, hurt, um, you know, the, the weakest in society, working class people. Um, and and middle class people, it's it's they they've caused a massive transfer of wealth, probably one of the biggest transfers of wealth in such a short time that we've ever seen from the lower middle classes to the um, the, the, the 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 global plutocrats uh, uh, and 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 some of the biggest corporations on on the planet. It's caused you know I mean democracy, which wasn't doing that well even before the pandemic, to be compressed to, to such a level where I think you know. Uh, one has to wonder if we can even, you know, speak of living in democracies anymore when all those, you know, safeguards and guarantees and uh, and 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 rights that we took for granted and that you know can just be swept aside overnight in the name of uh, of, of of an emergency or a supposed emergency. Um, and again, these the, these are things that the, the left used to stood, stand against. We all remember. Uh, you know, a, a big part of uh, the, the left's uh, struggle against the uh, the national, you know, the post 9-11 national security state was against the how, you know, the governments, not just in the US, but in the UK and other Western countries as well, used the terrorist threat to, you know, uh, compress the, 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 the boundaries of democracy, sweep aside civil rights and increase, you know, a societal control. And, and again, it was pretty clear that this, that the aim there wasn't just to fight terrorism, but that, you know, they were using this threat to, um, to pursue um, uh, uh, their own agenda, and 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 again, that's something that we saw on steroids during the pandemic. You know how the pandemic was used to just sweep aside civil rights, introduce completely unprecedented forms of uh, social control, of surveillance. Um, uh, it you know it, it's just been astonishing to see those on the left simply uh, you know uh, I, remain either silent about all this, if not actively embracing it. And if anything, criticizing the measures for not being uh, stringent enough. I mean, this has kind of been the standard left approach that, uh, you know, to the extent that there was some criticism of these policies, it was that these policies were not restrictive enough, that we didn't lock down uh, harder uh, or sooner enough. I mean, this 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 has kind of been the standard um, left left critique throughout the, throughout the pandemic. And um, so in a way, as people from the left, we felt compelled to write this book also to try to understand how so many of our former, you know, comrades ended up uh, taking this uh, absurd stance, in our opinion. Do you, this is very interesting. Do you, so do you, do, I mean, is left and right the right terminology mm-hmm. at the moment? Because if you look at someone like uh, a British left-wing politician or so-called left-wing politician like Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, mm-hmm. you know, that, that these are not... Um, these are, he's an authoritarian. He's not really of the left, I would say, at all, um, because of for all the reasons you've just laid out. Um, tell me, why did we throw away every single fundamental human liberty mm. at this time? And uh, tell us about the COVID consensus, the global yeah. assault, democracy, and the poor. I mean, on the left-right issue, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think these terms are completely obsolete terms that really, they don't reflect, I mean, they don't really mean that much. I mean, I think they only create confusion in a sense that those terms, they, uh, I mean, that, that what we consider to be left and right today has very little to do with what, what those terms historically have meant, uh, as you were mentioning. I mean, don't, mo- most of those that pass as the left today uh, have very little to do with uh, the kind of historical left grounded in the work, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the working class uh, movements of uh, of of the, of the past two centuries, uh, which kind of you know were the backbone of the socialist and, and communist movements. I mean, it has hardly anything to do with that anymore. Uh, and and e- and even and even the right today is not is is not even what the right used to be twenty years ago. For example, we see how for example you know, mo- the, the, in the U.S. The, the 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 few 
people that are against the war tend to be on the right rather than on the left. And of course, that's a complete inversion of what used to be the situation nowadays. I mean, if you want to get uh, the, the only kind of anti-war you know, information on the mainstream news you can get nowadays is Tucker Carlson, you know, which is, is pretty astonishing for, uh, I think, a lot of people on the left because they will remember, you know, Fox News being, of course, the... Uh, you know, the, 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 the house of neoconservatism conservatism until not too long ago. Um, so I think I really do think those terms don't really mean much anymore. I think we'd all be better off if we could just stop using those terms and just, you know, I think we need to come up with, you know, with a new way of understanding politics, a new political compass, which manages to just do away with the historical baggage that's attached to those two terms. And in fact, I think they've mostly become a way of controlling and dividing the masses because all it takes, I mean, uh, so long as people continue to identify them, those themselves through the kind of left-right dichotomy, it'll be it's, it's going to be very easy for those in power to simply ensure that you know any you know quote unquote populist that, that pops up uh, can be stopped from getting into power by simply painting him as either extreme right or extreme left, and that will ensure that a sizable chunk of a population that either identif identifies itself as left or right will not vote for that candidate, uh, irrespective of what that candidate actually stood for uh, or stands for. And so, you know, we saw that with... Um, with 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 Le Pen in France, for example, where I think you know, I mean, a lot of her policies were more left wing than definitely Macron, uh, and in fact, a lot of you know, so called left wing parties across Europe, uh, and we saw it with with Corbyn, you know, where potentially a lot of people that maybe would have been on the right would have voted for him if they hadn't if they hadn't you know seen him as a a, a left wing crazy, and so I think. Um, so it would it would do us all very well to uh, you know invent a new political language uh, that's proving to be uh, very hard. So I think you know we're, we're all trying to you know break out and, and break free of the 20th century, but it's proving much harder than than we would hope for. Um, in terms of why you know, why was it so easy to, to 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 sweep aside all our freedoms? Well, I guess uh, you know the situation was uh, was was ripe for. COVID, you know, for what, we, what we've witnessed over the past three years to happen. In this sense, it wasn't something that happened out of the blue. I think it was the result of a whole series of transformations that had gone on in our societies and our economies, especially in the West over the past uh, um, decades. And I think it's interesting in that respect, for example, to go back and look at the, uh, you know, uh, maybe few people will remember that we actually had a pandemic in 2009, you know, where, uh, um, uh, you know, the WHO deployed uh, actually the, the um, you know declared a pandemic in in 2009 but very few people remember that um that was over um, swine um, nine yeah and uh and 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 there was an attempt you know to try to whip up a bit of a hysteria hysteria there too i mean if we go back to the, to, you know to the news reports and the papers uh they were trying to paint you know uh this thing as a big deal but in fact very few of us remember about that so i think one first point that that points to is uh that that the propaganda machine today has become much more powerful than it was even just 10 years ago. I mean, we've reached a point where um, today the corporate media is uh, uh, incredibly more powerful, incredibly more concentrated even just than a decade ago. And this has um, wide ranging consequences because it means that today uh, the dominant narrative can be really harmonized uh, not just, uh, you know, within countries, but across countries as well. I mean, that's what we saw, for example, with, with COVID. Uh, this is what, you know, I mean, pretty much the same message, what we call the COVID consensus in the book, uh, being kind of uh, 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 harmonized across almost the entire planet. Uh, and in fact, I would say the entire planet. That doesn't mean that some countries didn't take slightly different actions from the ones kind of imposed by the uh, the, glo the global public health elite. But I mean, most as I would say most of the you know eight billion people on the planet were exposed to more more or less the same narrative on on COVID, and that's because today we have. Um, uh, you know, very tight levels of uh, kind of, of 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 integration between corporate media across countries, uh, and that's something that they've been building over time through initiatives, for example, such as the Trusted News Initiative, which was uh, launched by the BBC a few years ago to counter disinformation and misinformation. So there was already a grid, a kind of information grid, where the corporate media was already uh, already had, at, you know. Uh, places where it would come together and decide, you know, what message to spread across to uh, all their audiences across the world. And that was already in place. And that's something that wasn't there, for example, 10 years ago. Um, now we have, and, and that's why, 
some of the most powerful governments on the con on on in the planet and of course i would i would include the british government and even the us government and i think you know it's important to distinguish here between government and the state i think it's two different things so what we saw in the uk and the us was what no, you know, few people would disagree are two of the most powerful governments on the planet essentially being bullied into locking down and i think that's that's astonishing because it also points to the fact that power has shifted away from you know the executives and governments to other uh, you know other places of power you know maybe we'll, we'll return to that so i think that that's one issue um then there's the question of social media the internet which is i think that was a fundamental aspect again that's something that wasn't there 10 years ago uh, or at least it wasn't there you know to the level that 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 that, that is there now um, and what this means is that today we are immersed in this information flow almost 24/7 for pretty much all of our waking hours and that's very different because you know before social media uh yeah you know, as much as you know as effective as the propaganda might have been that was that you were still only exposed to propaganda for at most a couple of hours a day you know what while you were watching the news or listening to the radio the rest of the day you were engaging in real life and you know experiencing an unmediated reality um uh, today, you will mostly experience reality through, you know, through your phone and through social media. And that means that if if anyone can control anyone that can control that information flow will have a level of uh, control over people's thoughts and even emotions and feelings uh, greater than, you know, any tyrant has ever had. And I think, again, we witnessed that during, during the pandemic. We now know how can just how tightly controlled the information flow was on all the major social media networks, you know, from Facebook to Twitter uh, to, to YouTube, uh, and to a large extent still is today, with the exception of kind of post-Musk Twitter. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. And, uh, and again, that's, you know, I think that kind of explains how uh, people were able to, uh, you know, how, how people, you know, how it was fairly easy to get people to buy into, you know, completely unprecedented and almost unthinkable policies in such a short time. Um, so, so I think you know that the, the media aspect is fundamental, and then of course there's the fact that, as I was saying earlier, that power has shifted away from governments uh, to other, uh, uh, you know, other places, World health organization, etc. Supranational organizations, of course, and you know the media as well, and. Uh, and I think, you know, and these are institutions, whether at the state level or at the super state level, that have become increasingly captured by corporate interests, vested interests. I mean, this is fundamental. I mean, we, the entire, you know, COVID response was essentially, uh, you know, centrally managed um, by the, uh, or at least, you know, I mean, the, the, the main directives were coming out of the World Health Organization. Quickly speaking of banks, because you touched on banks there, um, and we've seen, uh, what's it called? Come on, brain. Um, Silicon, Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank. Bank. <laughs> Silicon Valley Bank getting bailed out. Um, the, well, the depositors bailed out. Yeah. And um, we're looking at uh, weaknesses in lots of other banks across the world at the moment. Um, do you think this is something that's going to escalate? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think this, uh, again, these are all different facets uh, of uh, what, of 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 uh, you know kind of the the, the of, of late cap of late western capitalism you know of just uh how messed up uh, the whole situation has become and all these problems ultimately you know are related to the same underlying problems so we've been talking about the pharmaceutical sector and the it sector but before that uh of course we know now you know it, now it's a bit less but we know that for a very long time the, it was the banks that were running the shows and uh uh, the show and um and, and to, to some extent that's still the case i mean none of the underlying problems that led to the 2008 crisis have been solved and so we still see uh banks engaging in largely you know speculative uh, activities which have uh, which have systemic risk and uh once again we're seeing that when you know when those uh, investments uh, go south, the state steps in and not only bails out the banks, but in, in many cases also bails out the, uh, uh, the, 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 the wealthy investors that were, that were essentially, uh, you know, playing. I mean, that's like a casino, you know, when you invest in, in these banks, you know, which promise high, you know, high risk, high return investments, it's like a casino, you know, I mean, you should, 
you know, I mean, it should be part of the rules that you can lose your money. Otherwise, again, I mean, this is just socialism for the rich. What we're saying is that very wealthy people can invest huge amounts of money uh, in high risk, uh, high return activities and you know, pocket the profits while things go well and will then be bailed out by the state once the, once the, when their investment goes bad. I mean, who wouldn't want to, you know, I mean, you know, play in a casino that, that works, you know, with these rules. You know, you get to keep the money when you're winning, but if you lose, you, you get saved anyway. You know the, the, these prop, you know, the problems relating to the structural, uh, uh, you know, the, the structural corruption. I would say that goes that goes along uh, in in the Western economies. Uh, yes, I mean it, it 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 pops up in various places and in different sectors. But you know the underlying problems are, are the same. Whether it's the financial sector, the IT sector, uh, the the pharma sector, what we see is that you know these 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 massive corporations essentially uh, are, are untouchable. And, and the other ones re- actually running the show. I mean, it's not it's it's not it's not the politicians that are running the show anymore. It's these people. Uh, it's it's these corporations. You know, it's the it's the people that you know uh, uh, go go to Davos every year. You know, and uh, uh, to ski and then drink champagne and, and discuss you know their, their plans for the future. I mean, these are the ones that this is where the real power is located. You know, it's not in the it's not so much in, in governments anymore. Uh, states all, have the power, all, but as I was saying earlier, states are not the same thing as governments. You know, you've got elements of the state that actually at work against elected governments nowadays. Yeah, which is terrifying because, as you said, socialism for the rich and, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a so-called free market that is only in the service of big corporations and is policed by the state. That seems to me to be corporatism. Yeah. In a way, a, a creeping corporatism. So it's actually uh, it's much more dangerous than people give it credit for. But everyone who says, you know, Davos and the World Economic Forum and these sorts of things, they were immediately denounced as conspiracy theorists, although they say it out loud and they tell you exactly what they want to do. And all governments pick up on their policies, the net zero policies, for example, and all the all the climate policies, which is going to be the uh, that's going to be the next uh, golden yeah. goose, isn't it, for uh, for the for the controlling corporatists? Uh, absolutely, yes. I mean, and again, I mean, the left the left uh, has has a huge responsibility here in uh, in 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 kind of. You know, legitimizing the mainstream discourse by attacking anyone that dares to criticize these policies as, you know, a, a far right nutter, a conspiracy theorist. Um, and um, uh, so, so so now you have this kind of, uh, f- you know, not only do you have this corporatism, which, you know, is just another word for fascism, you know, that's what historical fascism represented, kind of fusion of state and corporate power. And I think this is, you know, I mean, uh, similar to what we're seeing today, but now you have a woke version of fascism where you have this, you know, this, this, this private public nexus of power that legitimizes its own discourse uh, thanks to uh, the kind of woke progressive uh, class, which polices the discourse, which, uh, 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 you know, sets the, the, the boundaries of, the, of what's the acceptable critique of the policies um, and uh, and essentially ensures that, um, that 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 any that no that no you know profound critique of these policies uh, finds a platform uh, of, of any kind because they're the ones that decide you know what's what's the acceptable criticism and what's unacceptable and uh, uh, you know we clearly saw that during during the pandemic uh, where you know I mean the, the left was at the forefront of denouncing anyone. Uh, challenge these policies as you know racist fascist neo-nazis uh or, or whatever i mean it's been it's really been quite um quite astonishing and uh so um is that what yes, drove you to write the book sorry is that what drove you to write the book yes i mean in partly definitely i mean partly was it an attempt to understand why um why the left, you know, took the positions that it did, and and of course part part of it was also to try to you know to just set the record straight and 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 uh, uh, and and just show just how ridiculous uh, the, this notion that you know any that, that 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 there was something intrinsically you know racist or fascist about criticizing these policies when in fact uh, you know well, the way we see it, I mean that should have been the standard position of anyone that you know uh, stood on on the left and that anyone that you know. Is, is, you know, that claims to speak on behalf of the uh, of the working classes should have taken. Um, so, so I mean, this is yeah. I mean, this is what what uh, what drove us to write the book, and um, and 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 also hopefully to try to maybe you know, I mean, 
sort of build a bridge, you know, with, with that world. But um, from what we've seen up, up until now, I think uh, it's, um, it's it's maybe a bit of a lost cause because this is this is what they call in economy, you know, in economics, kind of a sunken costs. You know, when you've invested so much on in an idea or in or you know in, in a branch of your company, and even if it doesn't, you know, even if it starts losing money. A lot of people will prefer to keep pouring money into that rather than pulling out, you know, because you know you have invested so much in it. I think so many people have invested so much in uh, in 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 defending the COVID policies that it's going to be very hard for them. At least it would take a lot of courage for most people to uh, to to admit that they were wrong. Um, and in fact, well, we're not seeing that much of that, you know. And, and I can understand why on some level. Um, I find it. I find it. Um, I, I find it that 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 surely is the time to to push even harder on them. I mean, we've had Piers Morgan in the UK say, I didn't realise that it wouldn't prevent transmission. He didn't even realise it'd be tested. But this man demonised and other people on a daily basis for over two years. And I'm I'm afraid my levels of forgiveness for that treatment of uh, a fellow human being is just, it will never go away. I will never move on from it. Even though he said, sorry, I will go, you, you destroy people's lives. You actually have, you do have blood on your hands. And therefore now is the time to push uh, more to remind because you know if we're going to accept you as you say you know the covid consensus which is not i know that's not what you're trying to achieve in your book but you know we need this cautionary tale to be battered and hammered home to the, to those that next time hopefully won't be as fooled as they were this time no i i mean i, I agree i mean i know that there's that you know there's a lot of those that you know that supported the COVID consensus that are now uh, are kind of you know pushing a an amnesty like approach, you know, which is basically oh you know we all did mistakes, you know, on one side or on the other, but you know uh, it was a very confusing time, so let's just sweep it all under the carpet and let's just all admit that you know we were all wrong on some level, and of course that's completely unacceptable uh, because uh, in fact many of us, you know, I mean I'm sure you know we, we might have been wrong about a few things, but we were mostly right about most things. <laughs> So well, we I think that's for the hasn't correct taken thing. We were fighting for the right thing. We were fighting for their right one day for mm -hmm. them not to want to take a medicine of some kind yeah. or, or, or you know, not be able to provide informed consent. We weren't really fighting for ourselves, I didn't feel. I felt that we were saying to that to these people, there will come a day when a government or, you know, a supernatural organization recommends that you receive this medicine or this treatment and you may not want to do it. So what I'm doing is I'm laying the ground out now that you have bodily autonomy and, you know, a freedom to choose, which is a fundamental freedom that you would have, you, which is what is so awful that once now you can't unsee it. it we, the, the world has been plunged into this sort of very, uh, you know, you're being a bit more optimistic about it, which is that people want to brush it under the carpet. I think people are, are embracing the role of the state and that, and that they would, as you say, sunken costs, they'd rather lie to themselves than, it, than, than come face to face with the, with the truth, which was that we went from fe a, a mild sense of feeling free to uh, a sense of being absolutely battery farmed humanity in two years. Uh, absolutely. Um, no, I mean, I... I agree. When I say that they're, they're trying to sweep it under carpet, in a sense, I think they want to, you know, they want to stop any any kind. I mean, they they don't want any form of, uh, you know, uh, anything that's akin to a truth and reconciliation commission. You know, that's what I'm talking about. Like, they just want to, you know, uh, uh, stop discussing what happened and, and move on. And I agree that uh, those that are proposing this uh, definitely aren't don't have that many issues with uh, with with what happened and uh, and with uh, the the the. The level of uh, of uh, authoritarian control that uh, that that Western governments um, have uh, ha have acquired, I think it's uh, I think it also points to the fact that a lot of people on the you know on, on the left, I mean, they don't really they they talk about you know fighting the state and fighting power, but they don't really fear power. They don't really fear the state. Otherwise, they would be concerned about what's happening. Uh, so for a lot of people on the left, I think it's mostly a kind of, you know, it's, it's performative politics. You know, it's not it's not about, they don't really think that at some point they might actually have to fight uh, for, you know, their, their, their basic freedoms, you know, um, uh, which uh, which is what a lot of us uh, felt that, you know, we, we've been forced to do uh, over the past, um, over the past three years. Um, so, I mean, and, and moving on, I, I do agree that, um, I think, um, you know, unless there is a serious reckoning with what happened, 
we are going to just re- we're going to see a replay of COVID, uh, of, of the COVID consensus with you know the next emergency. I mean, and to some extent, we are already witness- witnessing that over Ukraine. I mean, a lot of the kind of the approach to, uh, I mean, at least the approach to managing and policing the debate, um, you know, over Ukraine is not that different from the way that the debate has been policed and disciplined over over COVID. I mean, now you've got a Ukraine consensus that, you know, has emerged, you know, very much in the same, in the same ways, you know, by the imposition of a single narrative uh, across the corporate, uh, across the corporate media, by, you know, policing quite tightly uh, uh, um, uh, dissenting opinions on social media, by demonizing and, you know, dehumanizing and even criminalizing anyone that doesn't agree with the, um, with the, with the, with the, 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 you know the kind of NATO approach to the issue, um, and as you were mentioning, I think you know there there are a number of emergencies to pick from, uh, a number of you know possible crises to pick from to uh, to continue this, to, you know, to keep us plunge into a state of uh, of permanent crisis, permanent emergency, and the climate crisis is likely to be uh, uh, one of the uh, you know one of the preferable candidates uh, for this, uh, absolutely. And I think uh, if, if one thinks about it, I mean that's the you know that's the emergency uh, and or the crisis uh, par excellence. I mean, what what's what's a bigger emergency than something that allegedly threatens all life on the planet? You know, I mean, that's that's way worse even than COVID. You know, and of course, so I think it's easy to see how, and that this doesn't mean uh, you know acknowledging that you know, of course, there's an environment. Of course, there are environmental problems in the world. Of course, you know, I mean, our you know, uh, our current economic system does have negative consequences on the planet. And I think, you know, those on the, cl- on the climate are just one. And in my opinion, not even the worst uh, of the of the consequences that this uh, uh, system has on the planet. Uh, but at the same time, it's pretty obvious that, you know, those that pushed for the COVID consensus and that are now pushing for, uh, you know, uh, the, the, that are using the Ukrainians to pursue a proxy war against Russia, the same ones that will use the next crisis, again, not to solve the problem, but to further their own interests. And, uh, you know, we're already seeing that. We're already seeing how the climate issue is being instrumentalized to push for certain policies, for example, in the farming sector and the agricultural sector, that again only benefits the big corporations, you know, the big investment uh, banks uh, by creating conditions where small farmers just can't, you know, can't make ends meet uh, because you know they're 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 forced to uh, to adopt a completely uneconomical. Um, Farming, uh, farming techniques, uh, which of course forces forces them out of the business, uh, which allows that that the, you know these small farms to be bought up at fire sale prices by the big uh, you know the big investment banks and uh, and, um, and and the big um, you know agri agri business uh, corporations. And uh, I think you know what 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 we saw what we're seeing in the Netherlands is partly a response to that. Uh, but you know you know the the, the effect the effect of these climate policies. I mean. Also extends to a whole you know, range of other of other domains. Uh, um, yeah, the European Union is pushing for you know. I mean, you, you guys are out. You know, uh, uh, luckily for you, but the European Union now is pushing for an absolute, you know, a, a completely crazy uh, green agenda that will essentially, if it passes, would essentially force uh, any 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 building you know in the European Union that wasn't built you know in the past ten years and that therefore doesn't meet the highest. Uh, um, climate standards uh, to be um, to be um, well to be brought up to the highest climate standard, basically um, energy standard. Uh, and you know, in a, in a country like Italy, where most people own their homes, that would mean a huge cost that would be landed on uh, on, on households, basically, uh, which would be forced to you know either pay out the money. To, uh, to 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 renovate their houses and put them in the right energy um, um, in the right energy classification, or they will be forced to you know sell their house uh, at, a, at a you know at a at a, at a at a lower price, at a lower the market price, uh, and again to the benefit of the big investment banks, which will, which will just come in and buy up all these houses that end up on the market. And so uh, again, it's easy to see how these policies you know are constantly used. To uh, promote certain interests uh, at the expense of, you know, the actual problem uh, at hand. You know, whether it's uh, solving the pandemic and stopping people from dying, or you know, actually, uh, uh, you know, actually, you know, helping solve the climate, you know, the climate or environmental problems that we that we do face. I mean, these are policies that go, you know, that have nothing to do with actually solving the uh, the underlying problem. And I think COVID is the 
most obvious example. I mean, we now know just how, you know, that that these, the, you know, the lockdown policies didn't even achieve their one stated aim of reducing uh, COVID deaths, you know. And so, yeah. I mean, how big of a failure could it have been if they didn't even manage to achieve that single aim, which wouldn't have justified lockdowns because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you, st you still have to take into account how many non-COVID deaths did lockdowns contribute to compared to how many, uh, you know, COVID deaths we avoided. So I think even if they had how managed... How many excess deaths we're seeing now? Yeah, exactly. Look at excess deaths and that says it all, right? Uh, and I think... But, and, it's, but it's, it's all about tactics. The, uh, the thing I've noticed about this stuff is A, it tends to have the word zero in it, which is ideological, and B, it's all about tactics. You never know what the um, strategy is. They never explain to you what the strategy is. It's like the tactics are we're going to use to get to zero, whatever it is, are this. But they 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 cannot authorita authoritatively tell you what the problem is. They just go, we have to have zero COVID. This is our tactics. And it's like, no, that doesn't work because you can't, virus, you can't make viruses disappear. They're here now. And it's the same with the climate. You know, every single prediction that's been made over the climate has been absolutely wrong. And it's stunning, I think, that people aren't awake to the fact that it's just another way of exerting, as you say, power and control and destroying the middle class. What do you see as the what do you what what do you see um, as we sort of come towards the end? What what's the future hold? Well, I mean, I think uh, there's a lot to be worried about. Um, you know, when looking at the future, of course, you know, I mean, all the trends that we have been talking about. Uh, on on one level, don't uh, you know, don't 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 really give us reason to be that optimistic. But on the other hand, I think uh, on many levels, the you know, there you know the attempt to usher in this uh, you know scary new world uh, you know um, under the guise of, of responding to the pandemic, uh, I think only uh, only partially succeeded. I think on some level it also failed. I mean, on, on some level, I think uh, you know they attempted. I think also to it was also an experiment. I think to to actually see just how far you can play with you know human nature. You know, just how much it was. They literally treated us like guinea pigs. You know, I mean, they they do experiments of these kind uh, okay. with animals. You know, they will isolate. Uh, and unfortunately, not just. Uh, uh, not just you know uh, uh, mice and I mean they do these uh, they do these experiments even with highly evolved animals such as primates and apes you know they will separate them from their family they will isolate them for uh, for months on end to, to study you know what their responses are and I think to, to some degree I mean that's what that's that's what happened to us you know I mean, it was this massive social experiment which I think uh, to 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 a large degree failed in that respect in the sense that. Uh, what we saw was that I mean you can only suppress people's need for uh, for you know for, for, for human bonding for social connection uh, so much and I think uh, at the end of the day uh, very few people would uh, there is a section of a section of society that I think you know actually enjoyed lockdowns but luckily it's, it's a minority you know of uh, uh, a fairly you know, patholo pathological element in society that does wield a certain influence, unfortunately. But I think it's still a minority. For mo most people remember that period as a pretty nightmarish uh, period. And so I think in that respect, um, there is an element, you know, a, a, a human element that has proven to be uh, unsuppressible. Um, and, and again, I mean, when, when power has to resort to such extreme levels of of control, of authoritarianism, it's also a sign of its weakness. I mean, power is at its, uh, uh, I would say, most powerful when it's uh, when it's when it when it when it when it works, you know, through an invisible hand, so to speak. You know, uh, when when it's when its power is not so obvious, it's not so manifest. You know, and so I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the the power was much more insidious. You know, I mean, in the you know. 10 or 20 years ago, you know, when most people weren't aware of just how, how, you know, how, of, of just how powerful these people were and are. Um, today, I think it's quite different. I mean, today you have this overt, extreme use of, uh, of authoritarian tactics. Uh, and that's because they can't, they can't rely on consensus anymore. They can't, they can't offer anything positive uh, to, you know, to the masses, to, uh, 
to sustain that, to sustain their role, to sustain their power. Um, this, this is why they have to resort to fear, basically, to, uh, to, to, to maintain their power. And I think we've been seeing that going on for uh, quite some time. And COVID was an extreme example of that. But again, you know, the, the, the climate uh, terrorism is another way of using fear to control people, uh, you know. Uh, um, but, but again, I mean, it, it also, you know, there's a flip side to that. And that's also, I think, and, and the flip side of that is that it's also a show of weakness. Uh, and I think uh, more and more, you know, as I think more and more people are going to realize that uh, the, the king, you know, the king is naked. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. he's obviously going around naked. And of course, uh, a lot of people will be afraid to speak out and to actually say the king is naked because there are consequences to doing that. You know, I mean, there are. Uh, a wide range of consequences, and that's of course how you know power perpetuates itself. But I think you know you can only go around naked for so long, you know, and uh, and so uh, and um, so I think we are you know there are also going to be um, you know uh, reactions to what's happening. There are going to be backlashes, and I think yeah, the the game is is, is far from over. Uh, and let's also not forget that there are um, I would also say global realignments going on. And, and and so I think you know, um, I mean the grip. I mean the, the the grip that these people have on global power, I think, is also uh, is also diminishing. And I think we're also seeing a, you know, I mean, if you look at Africa and other places, I think we're also seeing a reaction to that. You know, where more and more countries aren't willing to be bullied into these policies uh, by the former colonial powers anymore. Uh, so I think there, there are a number of elements that I mean that you know it's. The future isn't fixed uh, uh, at all, um, I think. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen this in the past, you know, where, you know, power, you know, tends to concentrate itself, you know, as much as it can. But inevitably, you know, that it, it inevitably unravels at some point. Uh, it's always happened in, in history. And so, I mean, kind of extreme levels of concentration of wealth and power have never lasted too long in history. And I'm, I don't see any reason to believe that this time uh, should be uh, should be any different. It can't last forever. Well, that's that's actually hopeful and optimistic and tangibly so. Um, Thomas, can you tell people where they can find your book, The COVID Consensus, The Global Assault on Democracy and the Four, A Critique from the Left, co-authored with Toby Green? And we'll put uh, a link in the bio. Most bookstores, uh, I would hope, and uh, all online bookstores, uh, of course. And they can follow... Uh, Toby and I on all major social media, mostly uh, Twitter these days. Okay, brilliant. Well, uh, Thomas, is it Fatsy? Have I got that right? Fatsy, yeah. Yeah, Fatsy. I'm so good. Italiano. Grazie mille. Thomas Fatsy, uh, author. Thank you very, very much for joining me. Thank you, Lawrence. It's been a real pleasure.